Hello everyone and thank you for joining today's webinar about maximizing your use of Office 365. My name is Olivier Menel and I am the Events and Communications Officer at Connecting Up and TechSoup New Zealand. This webinar will be presented by Matt Waltons, who is Senior ICT Advisor at InfoExchange. This webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording and a copy of the slides will be sent to you all shortly. Um, you will then be able to access them at any time on our website. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them in the questions box on your webinar panel and we'll have a couple of sessions in which Matt will answer them. We have quite a large number of participants today, which is very good to see, um, but it means that we may not be able to answer all your questions during the webinar, uh, even if we try our best. Um, but we'll make sure to answer them via email afterwards. If you have any technical issue, please also type it in the question box and I will do my best to help you with it. And that's all from me. I will now hand over to Matt. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Ollie, and welcome, everyone. It's great to have so many people here today really wanting to hear about how we can use Office 365 better. So I know some of you here today have been in our other webinars that focus more on how you implement Office 365 and the migration process. And I know some of you have also been involved in our do-it-yourself workshops, which have, have moved you on. But now that you're on the platform, now it's looking at, okay, how can we use it better and produce some uh, great benefits for our organization. So, We've been helping hundreds of uh, organizations move on and then supporting them on an ongoing basis. So we have seen a, a range of different ways that you can use Office 365, both for really small organizations, you know, down to one or two users, up to organizations with thousands of users. So. There isn't a one-size-fits-all approach to Office 365 and, and we'll focus on that today around picking the best applications and ways to use it that suit your organization. So hopefully today we'll highlight a few of the areas that you can explore that will add value to your organization. So we'll focus on, I'll touch on what's new. It is a changing environment. There's something new there every week. So we'll, we'll touch on that and give you some tips on how to uh, keep an eye on that as well. We'll touch on some of the key applications like SharePoint, Yammer and Skype for Business, which are three of the most popular components of Office 365 and adding the most value to a lot of organizations. We'll touch on mobile devices and authentication as well. And as Ollie said, I'll, I'll stop about halfway and we'll leave some time at the end for questions. And yeah, more than happy to answer some questions offline as well. I'm not going to go into too much technical detail today. I'm going to try and keep it as, as broad as possible so it's relevant to everyone. But um, we might drill down. Um, on, on a couple of different uh, areas. So just touching off really quickly some of the reasons again why we're on Office 365. I, I think it's always good to look back at what's the whole point of this, why are we moving before we go too deep and, and um, too far down any path. It's good to just think about why we're doing it. So really the, the key one is it's letting someone else worry about our technology for us, not having to worry about hardware failures and in server upgrades and all those sort of things. So we're really essentially outsourcing our server hosting instead of hosting Exchange and SharePoint and Skype for Business all separately. We're now letting Microsoft do all that for us. So again, the whole point is we're reducing the, the time we spend and the money and the effort on the technical side of it and the, the back-end infrastructure and hopefully spending the time and money on actually how we use it and, and getting the best business benefit. Well, one of the main reasons organizations are moving to Office 365 is for mobility so people can access their documents, their emails, all their information 
from any location. We're getting more and more mobile and organizations are getting more and more national and, and working across multiple locations. So, so again, it needs to be accessible from, from all sorts of devices, um, including mobiles. The other one is just keeping up with all this security and privacy and the compliance is, is something that most not-for-profits don't have the time or knowledge or to focus on. So again, just outside, outsourcing that part of it is uh, a, a bit of a weight off. Business intelligence is becoming more and more of a focus for organizations when you start thinking about outcomes measurement and really getting that information about your organization at the fingertips of those who need it. So it could just be a dashboard for a CEO to see what is, how his KPIs are going this month or, or you know, some financial performance figures or data collection. So it's looking at that um, sort of data and, and Office 365 can give you the capacity to do that. Um, enterprise social. So it's really about collaboration. So how do we work together, co-author documents, discuss, work on projects, work as a team, um, and have that discussion at an organizational level. So again, Office 365 can help us do all, the, all these things. So when you're choosing applications, again, bring it back to why, you, why you're doing it. So when we talk about applications and we talk about Office 365, we're talking about a platform really. It's not one thing, it's not one tool. It's a range of different applications that do a range of different things. And again, even, even some of these like SharePoint can do a lot of different things for different organizations. So um, this suite of applications is constantly growing. So even that security and compliance uh, logo down the bottom there, that actually, they just released the new one last week. So that's reasonably new. Sway and Delve and Video, again, are reasonably new. They've only been there the last few months. Um, CRM and Power BI, they're add-ons that you can have if you want to. So Power BI is a, an additional cost for a business intelligence tool. CRM is obviously for member management. Um, again, that's an additional cost and an additional setup, but it's all integrated into the one suite, into the one username and login that all your staff can access in the one place. I think the key thing to focus on later, um, and, and, and we'll talk through it today, is which ones of these are relevant to me. So again, many of you won't have CRM as part of Office 365. Many of you won't need Power BI. Some of you won't even ever, ever use it. So when we're talking today, don't assume that you have to use it all. We can just pick the bits that are relevant to you. So for example, many of you and many of our, our clients have just implemented it for mail and calendar and contacts. So instead of hosting an exchange server, they've just used mail and calendar and contacts. They still have their documents on a file server or they still um, use a Facebook group for collaboration. So that you don't have to use it all if it doesn't, doesn't suit you. Um, but as I said, it's constantly changing and will, it's something you need to keep an eye on. One way you can do that is there's a publicly released thing called the Office 365 Roadmap, Office 365 Roadmap, and you can see what releases are coming and, and what's in progress and, uh, and, and what's obviously being released. So it's a, it's a really, and most of the information is reasonably high level, but we keep an eye on this reasonably quick, you know, closely because we're really interested in a few things that are, that are on this roadmap that we're waiting to be launched for these. Some of you may actually proactively look at this roadmap. Um, 
others will rely on partners like Info Exchange or, or your local support provider to provide you with the information saying, hey, there's this new tool. Have you considered um, Office 365 Planner or, or whatever it may be? So I just wanted to point out that there is a roadmap there and you can click on each of those launch, rolling out in development and, and flesh that out a little bit more. There is actually, tomorrow I'm actually going up to Sydney to a Microsoft, uh, their roadshow, they're coming around the country um, or the, around the world with this roadshow talking about their roadmap a little bit more. So um, again, after tomorrow and Friday, I'll have a bit more information on, on what's coming. Some I may see some of you there. Um, I'll touch on it later, but we're also in partnership with Connecting Up. I and, and Ryan from Connecting Up and some of the team are actually doing a not-for-profit Office 365 Roadshow where we will travel around the country and we'll have one in every state, I believe, to tell you about things that you can use from an Office 365 point of view So, um, and, and how to use it best. So we'll, we'll cover that off a little bit later again. But for now, let's talk about the roadmap. So out of all of these things that's on there, you can see there's 106 things in development. I'll tell you a couple of the things that I'm really interested in and, and our clients are really interested in. So Skype for Business currently is a standalone tool that you essentially need an internet connection to have a video conference or, or make a voice call using a phone line. However, Microsoft are currently working on um, what they're calling voice integration and a PS10 conference dial-in number, which they've said they will release between July and December this year. It's actually already been released in the States, so we know it can work. And what that allows you to do, it, some organizations may actually use it as their, their phone system. So you can use your laptop with a headset um, as a and, and make phone calls um, to, to people without Skype for Business. And you can set up video conferences and give people a dial-in number, like many of you have used um, today with GoToMeeting. You may have called on your phone on a dial-in number, um, whereas currently Skype for Business doesn't do that. You need to have a Skype for Business client and the internet to access Skype for Business. So that's a really exciting tool that um, Microsoft are releasing, and again, we're hoping to get an announcement on a date tomorrow at the at the roadshow. So, but we expect late in the year because currently for voice integration, you actually need a Skype for Business or Link server in in your environment. So that's a that's a big investment for a lot of organisations. So many haven't done that. So um, that's something to keep in mind. If you know in 12 months your phone system is going to die and you're a reasonably small not too complex organization, it could be something to think about. The other thing that's available now um, in most tenants is what's called mobile device management. So essentially it allows you to remotely wipe or lock or manage information on your staff members' phones. So for example, if they use an Outlook Web Access app to or to access your company emails on their phone and they leave your organization or they, lo they lose their phone on the train, you can remotely wipe that information. So from a security point of view and also a management point of view, that's a really cool tool that uh, is, is worth considering. Another new one that is, is out in, in first release but uh, we're actually really excited about is what's called Office 365 Planner, and we've, the, our testing so far has shown that it's a really good tool for project management. So for particularly smallish organizations and teams, you can set up groups and have you know, tasks and Gantt charts and, and really project areas that you can use for planning. Now you can do project management in SharePoint currently, um, but what they're looking at doing is designing this standalone tool called Planner that can do that a, a bit better. So again, we're, we're, we think that's got some good application to um, not-for-profits and it can be apparently reasonably easily implemented, whereas SharePoint project sites are a little bit of work to set up. So 
that could be something that uh, a lot of organisations start using. Office 365 groups, uh, they're, they're already available in many of your sites. So essentially you just go create a new group and what that does, it sets up a little area for that group. Now that little area has a document library, it has a calendar, um, you, can, you can see emails uh, for the group and you can do a few little things that are group collaboration. Now again, SharePoint does that for team sites, but again, can take a little, little bit of setting up and a little bit of management. But for what, particularly small organisations, I'm on the a board of a not-for-profit and in, recently I implemented Office 365 for them and instead of setting up a SharePoint intranet, I actually just set up two SharePoint groups, Office 365 groups, sorry, one for the committee, one for the staff, and we're going to use those as our collaboration areas instead of a SharePoint site. So because they're small, they didn't require any sort of complex uh, requirements or lists or libraries or um, workflows or anything like that. They just need a small area where they can store a few documents to share within a group. So again, have a look at that, have a play with all these things and, and see how you go. The other thing that we're really excited about is the new Sync client. So currently the, the Sync client is called OneDrive for Business Sync. And that's the tool that you use to synchronize your documents from Office 365, so either OneDrive or SharePoint, to your local desktop and allows you to see all those documents in Windows Explorer and have an offline copy. Now, to be honest, the, the Sync client when you're syncing SharePoint libraries is has caused some issues in the past for some of our clients. So it can be buggy, there can be sync issues, uh, particularly on poor internet connections or large files, there can be issues with that sync tool. So um, we're really looking forward to late this year apparently, where the new tool is designed specifically for SharePoint and it can more easily sync those documents in your SharePoint library and apparently it's got some more flexible features around what you sync and, and those sort of things. So again, there there's some things that we're really looking forward to them launching and there are a heap more as you saw on the roadmap. There are a heap of, of new things and um, we encourage you to just keep an eye on it or, or have a partner or or a staff member who can keep an eye on things that uh, may be relevant to your organisation. So, but before you implement all these new things, the, it's really important that you have a planned approach. Before you just go off and launch off a 365 planner and make all staff use it, it's, it's really important to plan that. So we suggest that the first thing you need to do is determine your requirements and, and use cases. So who will be using them? Is it something that all staff are going to use? So for example, Power BI for business intelligence, most of the organizations that, that we work with that have Power BI, it's really just the management team that need Power BI. So it's not something we launch for all staff. Um, so consider who's using it um, and why what is the key reason for accessing it? So again, you need to think of what's the whole point of it and does it actually add any value to your staff members? Because with each new tool that you introduce to them, it requires in some cases training or change management or a, a bit of an effort from the staff to be able to use this new tool. So you need a good reason for why they need to use it. The other thing is um, when will they use it and on what device? So again, we work with some organisations where childcare, for example, in many of our childcare centres, the staff actually can't use the devices while they're on the floor with the kids. So they can only use it after they finish their shift and they've got a limited amount of admin time. So again, they don't want to spend a lot of time mucking around. Um, however, we have a lot of other clients who actually use their devices with their clients in, in meetings and they take case notes and a range of things, um, but they're using them on mobile devices. 
tablets and, and iPads or, or, or phones or Android phones. So what you access is important to consider and on what device. And what information are they looking for? So what, why do they go to your intranet and what actually do they get to download that, that information or access that CEO blog or whatever it may be. So these are things that you just need to ask yourself before you launch off. Um, what tone and style would they expect? So we, we have this discussion with many of our clients around, you know, do, do they just want a casual place where they can discuss and bounce ideas around? If that's the case, maybe Yammer's the platform. Or do they want a more formal intranet style platform where the CEO is, is posting you know, um, more formal policy changes and those sort of things? And if that's the case, maybe SharePoint intranet is, is more appropriate. So that's, that's uh, again, something to think about. What type of content do they feel comfortable sharing? So, um, and what are they allowed to share from a privacy point of view? And is it photos and videos, or is it just um, little little text messages? So, again, what content drives what platform you use? So, if you're doing videos, maybe Office 365 video or or a Yammer post. Whereas, if it's just text, maybe it's a Skype for Business instant message. So, there are there are different ways to um, share content. And what would motivate them to use it? So, we have a lot of We'll talk about adoption later, but we have a lot of um, organisations that struggle getting their staff to use it. So maybe you need to put content there that actually is, excites them or, or gives them a reason to go there. Um, so when you're launching an intranet, for example, maybe maybe tie in um, a link to the payslips or, or something that they actually want. Um, so as opposed to trying to push push information down their throat that's not relevant to them. And what does success look like? So you need a KPI. You need a you need to be able to track whether the, this thing's working. So maybe success is 50% of my staff logging on a weekly basis, or maybe it's uh, I want all staff to post one Yammer post every every week, or I want all staff meetings to be done using Skype for Business from now on. So doesn't matter what your KPI is as, as long as you're tracking it and, and monitoring it. So once you've gathered your requirements and your use cases, then you should be able to assess which Office 365 application is suitable for you. So here's a really high level, um, some ideas around what's good for what purpose. Now again, it's different for every organisation, and there's always uh, idiosyncrasies with this. And you know, large organisations uh, have more complex requirements. But uh, this might give you an overview. If you haven't launched anything yet, this might give you an idea of where to start. So, as I mentioned before, if you're a small team and all you want is a document library and maybe a calendar and a couple of sharing things, maybe just set up an Office 365 group or two. Um, if you want to have really robust discussion and collaboration in, in groups, then Yammer is, is a really good platform for that. It's like a, they call it the Facebook for business. So it's like a social media style platform. Whereas if you're a larger organisation and you want a more formal intranet where you can store your policies and procedures and in some cases collaborate on documents, maybe have a board area or some team sites for staff, SharePoint is, is really the place to go for you. As I mentioned before, business intelligence and reporting, um, there's a newish tool that's an add-on, it's an additional cost, but uh, Power BI is, is, is constantly getting better and is worth exploring if that's the sort of um, dashboard and, and graphs and um, that business intelligence is something that excites. Often it's your CEOs and your finance managers that get, and boards that get excited about that. So that's something that um, is, is worth looking into. The messaging and video conferencing. So if you're really just wanting some instant messaging and the occasional video conference, Skype for Business is a really good, again, all of these tools are included. Um, as part of your Office 365 suite. So, 
Skype for Business and it's, it's really actually easy to implement. So you can just turn it on and, um, and start using it for instant messaging and um, point of presence, which is understanding where your colleagues are at any given time. So OneDrive for Business, and we'll, and we'll come back to this, but uh, if you just want an area where individuals can store their own working documents, and you don't necessarily need to do a lot of sharing, you just want to make sure they're not storing them on their desktops and, and that they're backed up. So if their desktop you know, hard drive dies, that you're going to have these documents somewhere. Or again, they can access them from home or, or from a remote location. Each user gets a OneDrive for business. They get a terabyte of data. So having OneDrive for, for each user just to store their documents is, is pretty simple and uh, a, a good place to start. The other thing SharePoint does, which we'll again touch on later, forms, lists, and basic databases. So if you, if you want to start exploring some of that admin function and IT requests or new starter forms, and, and you have someone who's a little bit tech savvy that can do this on SharePoint, then that's, uh, that's something to look into. Instead of having a hundred different databases, you could maybe just do some sh basic SharePoint lists. Now, if you want to just access your emails and calendars from your mobile, now again, we have lots of clients who this is all they use Office 365 for. There is a good app now, Outlook Web Access mobile app, um, that you could use for accessing uh, your information. Um, project management. So again, we've implemented project management solutions on SharePoint in the past, or Office 365 Planner should be able to help with this. So there's some ideas about what, what the purpose is and then what application may meet your needs. Now I haven't covered off everything there, but uh, again, it's, it's just getting you started. But before you launch any application, the key thing to think about is adoption and getting people to actually use it. We've seen the best SharePoint sites in the world um, not actually add any value because staff don't go there and they don't have time to go there or, or the interest. So you need to drive that adoption in your team. So the first thing to help with adoption is just use what you need. You, you don't want to confuse staff with 10 different applications. Go to Yammer for that, go to SharePoint for that, go to Groups for that, go to Planner for that, go to Outlook Web Access for that. Go to, you know, if, if you've got a small team with basic requirements, try and just pick a couple of platforms or one or two platforms that will meet your needs instead of trying to confuse them with lots of different uh, platforms. So just picking the ones that add value and even staging it. So start using one and if it, if it doesn't meet your needs, then um, you know, start using another one instead or as well. The other one that we often see people forget is explaining the benefits and reasoning. So telling people why are we moving off our file server? You know, a lot of stuff, I still love the file server. Why do we have to move? So it's, it's explaining some of those benefits around disaster recovery or risk management or cost savings or whatever it might be to say, hey, with all the money we saved on infrastructure, we can now put that into improving our programs for our clients or whatever the, whatever the benefits and reasoning are. Um, the other thing that with adoption, we've seen some organizations do this really well, give your intranet, if you're launching something, give your intranet a name and a brand and put your logo in there and make it feel your own. I've seen some really fun names, you know, one was called Frank and, you know, another one was called Inside Play and another one was called Ynet and you can call these things whatever you want and whatever means something to your organization. And create a bit of hype about it. So again, another organization we worked with recently, they had posters all up all over the wall and in the toilets and saying, coming soon, you know, this new great platform, Office 365, you know, welcome to your, your new intranet. So create a bit of hype and get staff involved and interested in, in this and don't make it just about, hey, there's this new technology platform. 
make it, hey, there's this new thing that's going to make your life easier and help you as a staff member. The other key thing that we see um, provide really good the CEO and the management team really advocate and, and drive this. So if the CEO has a blog area on your SharePoint but still emails out his weekly blog or, or weekly newsletter, then no one's actually going to go to the intranet. So if you've got an area or, or if you want to drive traffic to your intranet or to Yammer or whatever it might be, get your CEO to be on there and, and your management team and then start making people go there um, and, and leading by example. But even, I'd almost debate even more important than having just the CEO and the management team is creating a range of people across the organisation that we would call power users or champions and essentially one in each team that knows about Office 365, understands why you're doing it and can use it and can help promote that at an on the ground level. So again, we've seen time and time again that the most effective training method is peer-to-peer -peer training. So if you've got a person in each of your teams that can talk to their fellow team members and say, hey, hey Johnny, come and I'll just show you this, how, how you use the intranet. Often the, the other people go, oh, is that how easy it is? Oh, I didn't realise that. I thought it was this big, hard, complex um, technology thing that they couldn't use. So I think just showing them and having delegating that responsibility to people across your organisation and not just leaving it to the IT team to promote these things. The other one is casual learning opportunities. So not everyone wants to go and sit in a four hour SharePoint training session um, and, and often that's not necessary anyway. But often people like to just throw ideas around or um, just ask the dumb questions. So just having those sessions where often we just say, hey, the IT guys or a, or a couple of people, they're going to be having their lunch in this room today and they're open to any, any dumb questions about this new platform. So if you want to learn about SharePoint or you want to ask silly questions about this new platform, go here between 12 and 1 and someone will help you. So it doesn't have to be a formal thing that, you know, again, takes time out of everyone's day could just be a, a, a really casual um, session. The other thing that is important is to incorporate it into all your regular communications and staff meetings. So put it as, as an agenda item on the staff meeting that every time you meet as a staff team you say, hey, how's the uh, new intranet going or how's the new Office 365 platform? Is everyone finding it okay? Is there any other information you need? So that's um, usually a, a key way to get people thinking about it. The other one, that, and uh, I mentioned it before, is really about just giving staff a reason to use the system. We, we have with some of our organisations had, you have to log into the new intranet to access your payslips on a fortnightly basis. And that basically guarantees that most people will log in at some stage, even if it's just a tax time, to see the intranet. So that, if you store them on there or have a link on there, then that's their reason to go there and from that they will then start exploring your, your platforms. So as promised, I'm going to pause there for a little while um, to answer some questions. Now after this, after this few questions, I'm then going to dig in onto each one. So I'm going to spend a bit of time on SharePoint, a bit of time on uh, Dell. Skype for Business, Yammer, um, Mobility, so or, and Authentication. So I'm going to come back to all of those things and dig in in a bit more detail, but uh, I'll throw out there for maybe just a few questions, Ollie, and um, yeah, we'll allow a few minutes. Yeah, we've got a couple of questions. And the first one is from Linda, who asks if Skype for Business would be suitable to for hosting webinars. Yes, it is. So we, we do host some webinars on Skype for Business. The one downside that um, it doesn't have right now is the dial-in number. So if, 
for example, you've got a staff team who are all using Skype for business, then we, we use webinars for that. That's great. They've all got Skype for Business installed on their PCs and they all um, can, can log in easily. If you're doing a public webinar and you want 150 people logging in to a, a, a webinar, then often we like to, and connecting up as well, like, like you've all logged into GoToMeeting, like to provide a phone number option for those who don't have a PC or can't install the Skype for Business client on their PC. So the answer is uh, yes, you can use it for webinars, but uh, ideally you would, for public webinars, wait until the end of the year when they're launching that phone number service um, for, for Skype for Business. Okay, um, you mentioned that individual had a one terabyte OneDrive limit. Um, do groups have a limit on how much can be stored in a more shared arrangement? Yes, there is a, a bit of a complex um, calculation for storage on SharePoint. So essentially Office 365 groups counts as SharePoint storage. So I'll send you, I can put it as part of the slides if you like, the formula behind SharePoint storage, but you essentially get, um, I think it's a terabyte off the top of the head, for the site, and then you get, I think it's 250 meg per user. So depending on the size, look, most people don't use all their SharePoint storage. But the other thing you can do is you can actually buy more storage if you need to. So if you're storing a lot of things on SharePoint, then there is the capacity to reasonably cheaply buy an extra 100 gig or, or whatever it might be. So. Okay, can you please explain how, where um, someone can find the Office 365 groups feature that you mentioned? So you can actually just create a group from within your mail. So within your mail app, um, so if you go to Outlook Web Access and um, expand your uh, sort of menu on the left, you can just go create group and it actually creates a group for you. Now on the roadmap, Microsoft are actually continuing to develop Office 365 groups and integrating it into all the different apps, including Outlook and including Yammer and all those other things. So you can create groups um, at the moment. I, I typically do it through uh, Outlook Web Access. Okay, maybe a last question and we'll keep the rest for the end. Um, can you talk about the benefits of OneDrive for business versus SharePoint for storing files? Um, which, um, like, which is easier to use for, for what? Um, can I defer that? I, I, in two slides time I'm going to cover that. So I think um, hopefully that slide will give you some information in the difference between SharePoint and OneDrive. Um, but it's, in a nutshell, OneDrive is typically we use it for individuals and SharePoint we typically use it for um, sharing across teams. Okay, um, just to come back to the group creative create a group. We've got Leona who um, asked you if you can give some clearer direction for creating one. She opened the webmail but couldn't find couldn't find it the option. Yeah. Um, do you mind if I engage offline with that and I can send I think there are some instructions online so I can I can send you some direct instructions on on that. No problem. Um, well, if you want to keep going and we'll keep the other questions for the end. Sure. Sounds good. So as I mentioned, we can, uh, I'm, I'm now going to drill into a couple of the different applications. And again, this isn't everything. I'm not spending a lot of time on Power BI today. I think we're actually wanting to run a separate webinar on Power BI and there are there is a standalone webinar on SharePoint implementation as well. So a lot of these are topics in their own right.
but uh, I'll touch on, on each of them today. So SharePoint, again, is a really flexible tool. It used to be installed on a server, and you can use it for a range of things, everything from an intranet to project management to document management to collaboration. So it does a lot of things. Um, you see there, it can also be branded as well. You can design it and, and lay a, sort of a skin over the top of it. There are also add-ons nowadays. You can buy from the App Store, in, in the Microsoft App Store, add-ons for things like workflow tools uh, or form builders or a range of other things that, that are even, even better and can provide you with additional functionality. Typically, we have seen a lot of organizations start using SharePoint for document management. So this is the slide I was referring to where we start talking about document management and using OneDrive and SharePoint. So typically, as I said, each user gets a terabyte of storage and the OneDrive is owned by a user. So if I store a terabyte of documents under Matt Walton's OneDrive, and then I leave the organization and someone deletes my account, all of those documents that are under my account are gone. Now, OneDrive has the capacity to actually share documents, but we typically don't recommend it for, for that reason. So if I share half of my documents with my team and then I leave, they will lose access to those documents. So. Look, I, I do share documents while I'm working on things if, if they're not uh, sort of cr critical. But typically, if you're going to share documents with a team, we recommend setting up a SharePoint site and, and putting documents there. Now, the thing to think about with SharePoint Online, I wouldn't automatically assume that SharePoint will be an easy, smooth replacement for your file server. Now, some organizations are using it for that, but using SharePoint is slightly different from using a file server. And one of the reasons for that is SharePoint is an online intranet. So technically, you should be accessing it through the web browser. So to access your documents, you go to the intranet and you find that document library. What you can do, and this is what I mentioned before, is currently a bit buggy and not definitely not perfect at this stage, but they're working on it, is you can synchronize your files in SharePoint or OneDrive to your desktop so that you can access them through Windows Explorer and you can do things like save as really easily. Um, or when you're emailing, you can attach really easily from your Windows Explorer when they're synced or when your internet goes down, you can access them offline. But please be aware that, that there, there can be synchronization issues with that OneDrive. There are limitations around what you can sync, how many documents you can sync. So before you just assume that you're gonna dump everything from your file server up on SharePoint and then sync it, um, it's worth talking to someone or, or doing a bit of testing. Because um, we, are, also recommend that large files like videos and um, large images probably aren't great to synchronize up and down on your internet connection all day every day. So again, we often recommend local storage for that as well. So that's often the diff when you're talking about document management, that's often the difference between OneDrive and SharePoint. Now they both have the functions like version history, so you can track when people edit versions. That you can co-author on both, which means multiple people can edit it at the one time. So most of the document management functionality, permissions, is all still available in both platforms. So they both have similar functions and features. So that, that's really the key difference. So most organizations use a combination of both. I hope that answered that uh, last question on um, on the benefits of, of each one. The other thing that SharePoint does, and again, this isn't for everyone, but SharePoint can do lists, forms, and workflows. So essentially, if you can think of some of those things that you've currently got in Excel spreadsheets 
or basic access databases or anything like that, you can probably put in a SharePoint list. So there's one there, for example, staff IT requests. So we've got a couple of organisations. They, they don't have a massive IT department. They don't need help desk software. But they have a form on their intranet where if anyone wants to log an IT request, they log in, fill out a form, and submit it. And then the IT guy gets an alert. And then when he's finished, he logs back into that form and says, status complete, etc. There's another one there, um, new staff members. So when we, at, at Info Exchange, when a new staff member starts, we put in a, a, a form request that goes to our HR department, for example. So there are some basic forms that you can do. Now, these you can do yourself. You don't need an IT person necessarily to do these, but you do need someone that can learn this sort of technical side of it. These are configurable forms, so you can just type in whatever fields you want. So you notice that department field there on that slide. We just typed in our departments. And now it can be a drop-down box where people select each department. So the, the workflows, again, when you, when you start getting into workflows, it gets a bit more complex. And you might need, you might consider whether you need another system. So for example, some organizations that have more complex HR requirements, they have a HR system. Um, so SharePoint will definitely not replace high-level HR systems or high-level health desk systems or incident management or h &S systems, but it can do basic things um, for, for those functions. So a basic incident reporting form, again, we've done that uh, for a lot of organisations before. So it's something to think about and, and again, start playing with to determine whether it's uh, suitable for you. Um, but yeah, be conscious that uh, it's got to provide that benefit and value. So if you start spending 20 hours trying to develop forms and workflows, maybe it's not worth it um, if, if you can just use a current Excel spreadsheet. So um, just, just have a think about things before you, you head too far down a path. The other thing that SharePoint does, and this is for documents but any item on any of those lists, it can collect data on any, any list item. So I'm, this screenshot, for example, I'm actually using it for documents, but again, it can be used for anything. Um, so metadata essentially can replace the old way of categorizing things which many people used to use or still do use, folders. So for this particular library, now again, this isn't suitable for everything, but for this particular library, for our policies and procedures, we don't put them in folders because in many cases, a, a, a privacy policy doesn't necessarily fit in a folder. It may fit under risk management, it may fit under, a, a, under policies, it may fit under a range of areas. So instead of categorizing things under one folder, you categorize them with lots of different categories. So it might be that you categorize them under department or document type or a name or who edited it. So each document can have as many bits of metadata as you want to allow you to search and find those documents um, or, or, or list items. So again, it's something, I won't go into too much technical detail about it, but um, if you've got policies and procedures or areas, it may be worth looking at, um, instead of using folders, categorizing them with metadata. The other way that Office 365 in general, and this isn't just SharePoint, is starting to um, search and find things is Delve. Now some of you may have seen Delve on your menu. It basically collects information about each individual and tracks who, who I'm dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, what documents I'm working on, and all of those sort of things. So you could if you were in my uh, Office 365 tenant, you could go to my Delve and see what documents I'm working on. So I actually use that to help find documents that my staff are working on. So I find it quite useful. Instead of doing a search or instead of sifting through folders, I actually go to Delve first and try and find documents. So, um, And that Delve is gradually going to 
spread across all different applications, not just SharePoint or, or OneDrive. Um, I'll move on. So before you head too down the far path with SharePoint, think about is, is it actually going to replace our file server or do we need local files? Um, are staff willing to change the way they work and access it through the web browser or use metadata? Or are our staff really resistant to change and love their folders and love their file server? Are there simple things that you can do, like forms? And are other platforms like Office 365 Groups or Yammer actually more suitable for what we're trying to achieve? So I'll move on from SharePoint, but again, there's other other webinars and, and uh, a lot more detail we could go into on SharePoint. Skype for Business is a bit of a no-brainer, really. Um, it's, it's really easy to implement. Not, not like SharePoint where you need to learn how to create lists and metadata and all those things. You basically just turn it on and start using it. So again, we use it for point of presence, which is on the right there, where you see Matt Walton's available. I'm green. Um, I have green next to my name, whereas Jane Rawson, she's yellow, she's away from her desk based on she hasn't touched her, her keyboard and some of those other guys are offline because their computers are off. So you can actually see um, what's happening in your organisation and uh, there's, a, there's a mobile app as well. I use the mobile Skype for Business to send instant messages instead of text messages um, and I use it for video conferencing. Um, quite regularly, particularly internally or, or with other people who have Skype. But again, things to think about before you use Skype. If you've, if you've got a really bad ADSL connection, I wouldn't count on doing a lot of video conferencing because the quality can be poor. And again, because it's got no phone integration, you're relying on your internet connection for audio and video. So I would hang out until later in the year if you're going to do a lot of video conferencing. Um, so if you have Office Pro Plus 2013 or 2016, make sure that's installed and then you automatically get Skype for Business. So alternatively you can download it separately, but uh, if you're about to install Office 2016 actually, not 2013, um, then you will already have it if it's Pro Plus. When you're doing audio or video, I would encourage you to use headsets and plug in your PC, don't use Wi-Fi, because again, it's relying on the internet quality. Um, you can share it with external organisations. So I have a lot of clients and connecting up and partners who I can instant message in and connect with because they also use Skype for Business. So any of you want to connect with me on Skype for Business, you can. Um, and consider VoIP in the long term. So again, we're, we're running out of time, so I'll skip... Uh, any other discussion about Skype for Business, but again, I can answer some questions offline. Um, Yammer is a really good tool. Essentially, Microsoft bought Yammer. They were a social media style platform, and we're seeing it, again, it's pretty easy to implement. You don't need a lot of technical expertise to implement, and you can use it for a range of different um, purposes, but really, it's for discussion, both in groups and at an organisation-wide level. And again, they've got a good mobile app. But before you launch too far down the Yammer path, I'd just consider what are you going to use it for? What content are you going to go on there? And what are your guidelines for content? Develop an acceptable use policy. So again, like any, any information platform, how are your staff going to use it? And what should or shouldn't they post on there, including what information is private and not? Um, who's going to, if, do you need moderation and, and admin? So do you need someone to monitor the um, content? And what groups are you going to set up? Maybe you want to set up topic discussion groups or maybe you want to set up department groups. And then you can send communication to guests around why they're using it and then invite guests and then drive adoption. So they're the key eight process steps that we encourage people to think about, again, before they just go off and start using Yammer. Um, all right. Sorry if I'm going too fast on some of these. We're just uh, conscious of time. So, again, I'll, I'll answer questions later. Mobility, it's, it's getting a lot better on uh, mobile devices. 
So all of those apps you see on my iPad there, they're all Office 365 apps and there are new ones coming all every day. So not every day, but quite regularly. So Outlook Web Access, I use on my iPhone as my um, mail calendar contacts all day. And as I said, I use Skype for Business and Yammer. I use all those different apps for on, on my phones. And as we mentioned before, mobile device management is, is now available. So I would pro you can still configure Apple Mail and all those sort of things to Office 365. So you can access it from any device or you can use a web browser on an iPad to, to log into SharePoint or any of those applications. But um, I, the, the mobile apps are typically better. Mobile device management I'd, I'd look into because again, if you lose that, that mobile phone on the train, it might have your client's data on it. So you, you, you do need to be conscious of that. And yeah, do you have an offline tool like the OneDrive Sync on your laptops for if the internet's down? Or do you have a plan for do people just tether off their phones if the internet's down or, or have some sort of backup internet access if people are out and about? So they're things to think about again before you go to mobile. Now, this one is not an application as such, but it is something to think about. Authentication. So if you're a small organization and you just want to set up Office 365 as a separate thing, which means users will get a separate username and password for Office 365 and then a separate username and password for their PCs or, or your other applications. And for some organizations, that's fine. Users can manage multiple passwords. But for larger organizations, and we're seeing over 50, typically you would start considering up near 100, um, you can set up a thing called directory synchronization. It's now called AAD Connect. You basically install it on a server you typically need a, an, a spare server in your office for this. And it synchronizes your usernames and passwords from your local Active Directory up to Office 365. So what that means is that the password that they log into on their PC is actually the same as the one they log into in 365. So um, that's often worth exploring. But if you're a, a really large organization, and you have lot, you know, and you're happy to invest several spare servers. You can set up what's called ADFS, which is federation, which means a two-way sync of all your um, identity, so your usernames and passwords, and you can access Office 365 in a more seamless way. So, again, that discussion can get a bit technical, but I just thought I'd mention that for those thinking about or getting frustrated with single usernames and passwords. So last five tips and then I'll open it up for questions. So really, as we said, just use the applications that add value. We've seen a lot of people try and use too many and it just uh, you know, frustrates staff from a change management point of view. So um, just con consider what you're using and how you're using it. So don't just set up SharePoint and say, okay, everyone dump their documents up there. Actually consider how they're gonna use it, what documents they're gonna put up there, or what is your acceptable usage policy on, on Yammer, for example. So think about how you're using it and then consider change management and adoption. So explain the benefits and get those local champions to, to make the most of, of the platform. Um, make sure your infrastructure is set up and this is where you might need a techni technical partner. Make sure you've got Office 2016 or 2013. Make sure you've got good internet connection. Make sure they've got mobiles that can access the, the new apps. Um, but almost most importantly, make sure you resource the platform. Um, it is constantly changing, so you need to keep an eye on it. It does require some sort of administration on an ongoing basis. So it doesn't have to be an external person. You could train someone up that doesn't necessarily have to be an IT person. So um, they're my top five tips. So I'm conscious of time, so I'm just going to um, mention a few. We've got readiness assessments, we've got do-it-yourself workshops, there's other webinars, um, and we can help with implementation or configuration if you need. 
Um, there's also that Office 365 Roadshow that Connecting Up and Info Exchange are running in June, I believe. I'm not sure the dates have been launched yet. That all that are open for not-for-profits to come and learn more about Office 365. So if, if that's something that you're interested in, please come and do that. All right, let's open up for questions. Thanks, Matt. Uh, we've got a few questions um, about Skype for Business. Um, firstly, so Skype for Business is currently not available for Mac. Um, are there any other elements that cannot be used on the Apple platform? Yeah, so you, you can obviously get Office for Mac, so a lot of those Office uh, ones are there. Um, the SharePoint Sync tool, we've had uh, issues before where the SharePoint Sync tool um, isn't available on the Mac yet. Um, look, they're, they're, they are developing most of these for Macs. Um, and I believe you can actually get Link for Mac. Um, I think some of our clients use that, so I'd double check that. I think it'd try searching for Link, L-Y-N-C. Um, but uh, yeah, they're the main ones that that don't work on a Mac. Obviously, you can access anything from a web browser. So everything else in Office 365, Yammer, and all those other um, SharePoint intranet, all those other things through the web browser, you can access through Chrome or Safari as well. And can Skype for Business be used to conference with standard uh, Skype addresses? Yeah, there is some uh, integration with Skype, so you can contact Skype um, addresses through Skype for Business. So, look, the integration is not great between the two, but it, it is getting better. You can um, sort of see all your Skype contacts through your Skype for Business. So, look, it's they are currently two separate platforms, but they're gradually coming together. Okay, is it possible to sync only certain folders or certain files in SharePoint and how do you do that? Not yet in SharePoint, that's part of, that's one of the features in the new tool that they're launching later in the year. I believe the new OneDrive tool allows you to sync uh, folders, like specific folders, but at the moment you, when you're syncing SharePoint, you, you sync a whole library but it is something they've mentioned they're, they're going to do in the new tool. So that, that may be actually a reason to set up your, instead of setting up folders, you set up separate libraries for the, the different areas you want to sync. So, because um, there's no limit to the number of libraries you, you set up. So some of our clients actually set up separate libraries for that, for that purpose. Okay, next question. Is there a way to archive users, uh, OneDrive users, when those users leave your organization? Yeah, you can essentially just take away their license and, and disable them. Um, we have other clients who actually have an, an, an area they call archive that they, they put all the um, information under. So it really depends what information. If you're talking about you want their mail and their OneDrive, typically you can leave client um, staff in there that are disabled and you just take their license away so they're not act and reset the password. So they're not active users, um, but you can keep all the, all the data in there. Particularly if you're getting the free E1 plans, that means you can have as many, um, as many people in there as you want. Does every uh, Microsoft Office application work on SharePoint Online, especially Access? Yeah, Access is an interesting one. Um, you can use some parts of Access, but I wouldn't automatically assume that you can put uh, an Access database, particularly if it's a complex one, just up as up into SharePoint. So. There are some limitations, definitely. You can use access through SharePoint, but yeah, if you've got a custom access database, I doubt um, that you can just 
dump it up on SharePoint, uh, particularly then sync it. So yeah, there, there are some limitations around access, but all other file types, um, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, uh, OneNote, all those things can, can be used. Visio and Project are actually a separate license that you need to buy. Is it possible for administrators to access all OneDrive files um, from the organisation? Yes, you can manage permissions to to OneDrive um, from from the admin portal. Yes, so essentially each OneDrive has, has its own permission set, like in SharePoint. So you you can you can manage those permissions. Can SharePoint lists be used for um, people who are newly hired and that worked remotely and don't necessarily log onto the domain? I'm not sorry. That I'm not sure what you mean by that question. Um, so SharePoint lists are where you would store a checklist or an IT request or those sort of things. Um, so people could, if they have an Office 365 account, they could log in to SharePoint and, and add a, a list. But it, yeah, I'm not sure if that's what the question meant. So again, maybe any of these questions that I maybe don't answer fully, feel free to email me directly. It's mwalton at infoexchange.org. Okay, an interesting question and an important one, I guess. Uh, what is a suitable broadband connection to support Office 365? Yeah, look, that's a really uh, comp tricky one. Um, I've got a slide here that's an appendices, but uh, it really depends what you're using. So if all you're using is email, and you're currently using Gmail or, or another sort of email platform, you're probably going to use the same bandwidth as on Office 365 as you were on most other email platforms. Because essentially the, each email still has to go up and down your internet. However, if you're video conferencing or you've got 10 people video conferencing at once, you're actually going to need a, a much better internet connection if you want good quality. Um, and the same goes if you're syncing a lot of documents with OneDrive, you're going to need, you know, a, a higher quality link than if you're just accessing it via the web browser. So, I'm sorry if that answer was a little bit vague, um, but there is no one answer to say, you know. So we have clients that operate with Office 365 on ADSL connections, ADSL2, particularly smaller ones where they access their uh, their emails. They maybe log on to a few things on SharePoint Online. Um, and maybe do the occasional Skype for Business video, and that works okay. Um, we have others that have upgraded to 100 meg fiber connections because they they want to do, a, you know, they've got 100 staff syncing documents and they want to do video conferencing. So um, it really depends on what you're using. Okay, we're running quite over time, so maybe one last question and we'll wrap it up. Uh, when you're working with Yammer, do the guests you invite require an Office 365 login? Yeah, so you can you can actually do, um, do it two ways. So you can automatically all your internal people will um, have a Yammer login. So they will need Office 365, but Yammer is actually one of the few platforms within um, Office 365 that me that you can actually invite external users. So you can send, have set up a Yammer external network, or or invite someone's Gmail account to Yammer. Whereas most other things, if you want people to log into SharePoint or uh, anything else, they typically need a Microsoft account. But Yammer is one of the few that allows you to do um, Gmail and, and other accounts. Okay, is there anything you'd like to add, Matt, before I wrap things up? Um, 
really just thanks everyone for your time and feel free to contact me directly if uh, there's any other questions or, or you need some support with your Office 365. And look, I'd be open to feedback as well as to what else people want to know so that we can look at what future webinars we may run. You know, if everyone wants some more detail about Skype for Business, we could run a separate one on, on that, for example, or uh, in any of these other applications. So I'm conscious that we covered a lot in an hour and went over time a little bit. So um, yeah, please send through any feedback to Connecting Up or us around what else you want to want to hear about. Okay, well, thank you very much, Matt, for presenting. And thank you, everyone, for joining us for this webinar. I hope you have learned a lot from it. As mentioned earlier, we will send you a link to the recording of the webinar and a copy of the slides shortly. Uh, if you have any questions that come to your mind later on, please feel free to send them through to events at connectingup.org, and I'll forward them to Matt, or you can email Matt directly using the address on your screen. Uh, and if your question has not been answered during this webinar, it will be answered by email shortly. Uh, and that is the end of this webinar. Thanks again for joining and please enjoy the rest of your day.